pretty soon. Um, there we go. And then we're going to jump into our amazing call that we have set today. So my name is Shanye. Um, I am the Director of Virtual Behavior Programming over at HRA, and I am joined by our co-host today, Lawrence. Lawrence, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? I am Lawrence Menace. I am the HR Director and Learning uh, and Development Director uh, at HRA as well. Yes, he's great. <laughs> he's awesome. If you don't know him, get to know him. Um, and we have an amazing call coming up up today with Jothi Robertson um, over from JBR Shelter Strategies and Journey Your Own. Um, so excited to have you on this call today, one of my very dear friends. Um, and we have a great call that is going to discuss um, the shared goals and visions between veterinary teams and leadership in um, shelters. So Jothi's going to, of course, introduce you to our topic as we get further along. Uh, but before we jump into that, we are going to um, quickly get through our national updates and our grant winners. Um, Lawrence, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to our intro before we jump over to our updates? No, well, I do want to uh, highlight, uh, well, I'll save it for our, our uh, announcements, but okay. we can jump into uh, everything first. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open up the floor for national updates. If you have any, please feel free to share now. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and share your updates with the group. We do ask that you keep it to under one minute to make time for the rest of today's program. We have a lot of interaction today, so get ready. Um, and you can also share the national updates and links directly in the chat. So we'll go ahead and open up the floor. Hi, this is Lisa Martin Garlic from Good Pup. Uh, I just wanted to announce that we have a webinar this Thursday coming up uh, at 2 p.m. Morgan Rivera from HSUS did a really great presentation about post adoption support strategies um, at uh, Expo, and she is redoing it for people that couldn't make it this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And I'll share the link in the chat. Thank you very much. As we all know, I am a huge supporter of Good Pup and all of the amazing work that they do for our shelters. Um, so go ahead and check that out. Um, I'll go ahead and throw in that the Solution Summit from AWA is coming up um, this week. You guys can hear from me this Thursday as we talk about um, the next generation of shelter employees and things that we can do to help um, support and retain our staff. And I'll go ahead and post that link in the chat as well. And while some of you may be thinking about other announcements that you want to make, I do want to uh, sort of highlight some of the work that I am uh, doing. Uh, some of you will, uh, in the coming weeks, start to hear from me uh, via Facebook. I am uh, starting or pursuing my dissertation looking at dog adoption decision making, and I will be in touch through my Facebook page, which is titled Dog Adoption Decision Making, um, to uh, ask for support and uh, outreach for participants. Um, looking for those that are in there, uh, that are in your communities that are looking to adopt an uh, animal, uh, adopt a dog, and for them to take a survey just to see what their uh, uh, the top factors are that it may affect and change their uh, dog adoption uh, decision. It's uh, something that I was recently published on in uh, Journal of Applied Animal Welfare Science. Uh, so this is for my dissertation to build on that. Um, and so again, you'll hear from me today. You can look look up that page on uh, uh, Facebook and friend me, like me, do everything that you need to. And uh, you'll hear from me in the uh, coming weeks and announcements uh, in our uh, future calls as well. And I'm just going to throw in my plug. If you guys have not seen Lawrence's chat, um, Maddie's community conversation from last September, mm -hmm. that is absolutely amazing. Um, and it kind of touches on on the work that he's done. So definitely check that out as well. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> if you guys can't tell, I'm huge fans of basically everyone <laughs> in animal well-being. So if you need someone to promote your work, just tell me. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, do we have any more, any other announcements, any other national announcements? 
Hey, hey. Lawrence and Shanye. Um, it's Amber from Maddie's Fund here. If there's no more announcements, I'd love to announce yep. the grant winners. Yep, <laughs> we'll go ahead and get to that. So we'll bring Amber up uh, to announce our grant winners. And if you do have any other uh, announcements, please go ahead and put them, uh, continue to put them in the uh, chat. Well, we'll turn it over to you, Amber. Awesome, thank you both. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Everybody see the May 2024 prize winners? Awesome. So we have our weekly community conversations winners. There's two $2,500 prizes. And remember, you can get these from watching our community conversations on demand or live. But for the month of May, our winners are Kathy Jensen from Humane Society of Southern Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. And we also have Susan Ganey from It Takes a Village No Kill Rescue in Evansville, Indiana. So congratulations to our Community Conversations winners. And let's see what else we've got. Oops. So we also have our Medis Pet Forum winner, and that's one winner of $3,000 for contributing on Maddie's Pet Forum. And we have Jordan Katzman from Furry Friends Refuge in West Des Moines, Iowa. So Jordan or Kathy, um, Susan, anyone on the call today? Yes, Susan's here. Hey, Susan, congratulations. Hey. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the award. Um, I just love these pet forums. I actually have Mondays off, so I love watching them on demand every week. So I appreciate that opportunity for those of us that may have Mondays off. But um, we are so grateful. Uh, we're in Evansville. We have two locations uh, in Southern Indiana, and uh, we're going to use the funds for an intake diversion program that we currently have. So we help um, community members that may just need a little bit of assistance to keep the pets in their homes. Um, and it's been quite successful. So the, the entire grant will go to our intake diversion program. Oh, Susan, we love how you're hearing about pets thank and you. people staying together. So thank you for everything you're doing for your community and you're getting lots of love in the chat. Oh, um, well, thank you. We, we we are so grateful for these programs. I mean, even if we didn't win the grant, uh, you know, they're very, very helpful programs. So thank you all for putting them on. Oh, we love to hear that. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Kathy or Jordan, are either of you on the call? I'm right here. I'm Kathy. Uh, Hi, I'm Kathy. Kathy. Arizona. Um, and I was holding off because our uh, new CEO, Kristen Barney, was going to be on this uh, call. Uh, and I wanted her to... Um, introduce herself and also let uh, you all know what the plans for the money are. Um, but we are so very thankful. Um, we, we really are. Um, I know um, there are lots of programs that need this funding. So I'm, I'm actually not sure which of the programs it's going to go to, but um, we will be very very grateful. Well, we're we're completely confident that you'll put it to great use. So thank, thank you, you, Susan, and tell um, your team thank you for all they do. We're very excited. So if I may, um, this is Danielle Brady. I'm the Chief People and Culture Officer at the Humane Society of Southern Arizona. So um, thank you to Kathy and, and thank you guys as well. So uh, we're going to actually use the money to um, make adoptions more accessible. We've um, extended our hours. And so thanks to these funds, um, we'll be able to use that for more marketing and outreach um, for our ongoing programs to be you know, more accessible to a more inclusive um, segment of the population and to serve even more pets and people who love them in Southern Arizona. So thank you guys. Thank you, Danielle. We love hearing about how open you can be, like, right, like literally with your yes. doors open, more hours for more folks who might not uh, be able to come in the hours you're open before. So that's super. Well, yes. congratulations, everyone. I won't take thank up you. any more time um, of the call, but thank you, Kelly, for dropping the link so everyone on this call has a chance to win. And congratulations again. Thank you all for all you do. I love hearing about what everyone is planning to do and 
um, how those funds are, are being put into their programs. That sounds absolutely amazing. So congratulations to all of our winners. Um, and thank you for participating. And thank you, Amber, for, for announcing those winners. It definitely is a highlight of my day. So um, we are right on time to go ahead and pass the baton over to um, Jyothi. Again, for those that have joined us, um, the person that you were about to hear speak is absolutely phenomenal in a variety of different ways. Um, yes. So I'm going to <laughs> shut my mouth so that way <laughs> you guys can hear as much as you possibly can from her. So welcome, Jyothi, to our call, and um, we're excited to hear what you have to say today. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's a I'm excited to be here. I'm Jyothi Robertson. Uh, I, I can get started, right, Lawrence? Shawnee, you're you're good for me to start. Okay, um, I think I've I've been on this call multiple times, so I know some of you. Some of you I have not met, but I see some of my friends in the audience right here. I am a veterinarian. I have been practicing since '05, and what's exciting is one of my classmates from vet school is actually here on this call from Montana, and we haven't probably seen each other in almost 20 years, so it's exciting that she's here. And I have been a consultant since 2010 through JVR Shelter Strategies after I did my residency in shelter medicine. And today I'm going to be talking to all of you about the relationship between veterinarians and leadership at animal well-being, animal welfare organizations. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can see this all right. Try to keep chat going because this is going to be some form of a participatory conversation. I see um, folks like Jose, Shania, others are here who can probably help me in the chat as well in case I don't see things. So the, the title of the presentation is Exploring Veterinarian Leadership Relationships in Animal Shelters. And it really started a year ago, almost to this day that I was invited to have a conversation on Maddie's pet forum, like in this in this area and also in the forum, related to veterinarians and leadership and how they feel, how vets are doing in their jobs, um, what keeps them in their jobs, uh, what is exciting about the relationship with the, the CEOs, executive directors, the leadership teams that they're in, are they in those leadership teams and so on. And I was invited to speak at a conference last year in August on this topic and although our team has done a lot of consulting with organizations over the years, we felt that we didn't have a broad enough perspective of how both leadership feels about veterinarians and how veterinarians feel about leadership. So we put out an informal survey. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Some of the questions that we had. And really, these were the questions that we had at that time. And, and these actually come from some of the conversations that we had, all of us, in this particular call in, in the chat. And that's what led to some of, some of the survey questions you'll see. So at that time, and even now, we were asking, you know, how, how can we attract and retain vets in shelters? And what are some factors that are causing veterinarians to leave? whether it be the organization or the field of sheltering? And what leads to effective veterinary leadership teams? So these are the, some of the questions that I had, and I'm curious to see in the chat, are these questions that you are asking yourselves in your organizations today? Are these still areas that you're interested in? And are, these, uh, are there other questions that you've been asking related to veterinary shortage, veterinary retention, some of the concerns around that. And again, feel free to place into the chat. This is going to be participatory. So as I continue, I will look back at the chat. Still great questions. Yes to all of the questions I'm seeing. Okay. So some of them are valid. Some of them will still be valid today. The study that we did started on June 13th. I believe was the date that we rolled it out. Yep, June 13th of last year. So almost to the day. I rolled it out in one of these Maddie's calls. We invited individuals to take the survey who are specifically veterinarians or in leadership roles. And we split it out further because what we realized is that there are veterinarians who hold leadership roles as well. And so we wanted to distinguish between these three populations. 
those non-veterinarians who are in leadership, veterinarians who are in leadership, so we put that as VL, and then veterinarians who are not in leadership roles. And as you see, we got a really nice distribution, actually. Almost 50% of the individuals who answered the survey on the leadership side were purely on leadership, not veterinarians. And almost 50% of the other group were veterinarians split almost equally between those holding leadership roles and those not holding leadership roles. And by the way, I show all of this because at the end, I'm going to give you a QR code and a link, and I'd like all of you to take this survey. And now we've expanded the survey. So if you work with veterinary teams, meaning in medical, whether as a veterinary assistant, a technician, with a medical department, you would answer the veterinarian survey. And if you are not a veterinarian, you'd answer the other survey, which is right now labeled towards leadership, but we can expand that out. And when you put your role, we invite you to put your role as whatever role you're in currently. So this is our breakdown for the data that you'll be seeing. We also asked what type of organization are you coming from? So again, we wanted to have an understanding of if we're getting a, a broad representation. So there were quite a few individuals coming from municipal type animal control agencies. There were quite a few from nonprofits without animal control contracts and also those with animal control contracts. And then a few others who could write in what their answers were, whether they're from academia or a for-profit or a low cost care facility. And again, now we're expanding this to include veterinarians who are doing spay neuter and veterinary technicians who are involved in low cost um, clinics and so on. We also wanted to find out where people are answering these questions from. Now you'll see an over-representation of the Pacific West Coast. And for us, um, I am in California and we have quite a lot of contracts in California, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii. So it was natural that more people would be responding from California. We also asked a lot of these questions and invited people to take the survey in one of the California calls. So we're overly represented by the Pacific Coast. We would love to see representation by other, other parts of the country as well. And uh, by the way, if uh, my colleague Ross is here and he's the one who's the first author on the paper that's coming out. And so he may end up answering questions in the chat as well. And uh, yes, and then you will get a chance to see where is Texas? That is a great question, where's Texas? I wonder if that got cut out when I wrote it up in a funny way. No, there are definitely people who answered from Texas. So this is very interesting to see it this way. Sorry, that might've been my mistake when I shifted the graph from being sideways to up and down. I think I lost a component. My apologies to everybody from Texas and the South. Oops. Okay, we will fix that in our next slide. Sorry. <laughs> I. I had it sideways and what was happening is it was really hard to read. Yep, so the whole South is missing. Uh, exactly, to everybody asking about the South, there's a whole Southern section that's completely missing because what I did is right before this call, I shifted the graph from sideways to um, vertical so I could read it better. And I think what I did is I cut off an entire column. So my apologies to everybody from the South. When I place this, um, the slideshow into the Maddie's conversation when I share it out, I'll share it out with the correct uh, geographic distribution so that all of you can actually see it. So apologies there. So the other question that I was asking was, uh, what is the organization's annual operating budget? And just a rough estimate. And what's the annual intake? And again, this was to get a better understanding later on, which we haven't actually done this yet, but we intend to do this, is take a look at it. If an organization has a really high budget or higher than others, are they more likely to maybe offer something for the veterinarians and the medical team that has them staying? Or 
Perhaps on the flip side, let's say you're a smaller organization with your annual intake. Maybe there, the veterinarians working very closely with leadership is on leadership or or involved in a lot of the decision making and has a, a, perhaps a more positive, successful relationship. And so understanding the number of, of animals that are coming in and a rough annual operating budget could help tease out some of some of those questions that we had. We also were very interested in knowing how many years both the veterinarians and the people in leadership were in those roles. What I think is really interesting here is that there's quite a few people who answered who have been practicing for a long time, more than 10 years, as you can see. And the same occurs for those leaders, um, those people in leadership roles quite a few of the people answering had been in animal welfare for a long time. Now, notice we didn't ask the question, were they in a leadership role for this time? So there are definitely other questions that we can tease out, but they have been in this field for a long time. And then we ask the question, how long have you been working with your current CEO, executive director, or leadership of the organization? And likewise, how many years have you been working with your current veterinarian? And as you can see, that's a lot less. Again, some, some interesting things to be able to tease out of this as we continue with analyzing some of this data. So let's look at our first question related to uh, the way that this is showing up. By the way, I just have a technical question really quickly because I haven't used the chat in this way before. When I move the chat, do you see the chat moving? And do you see it blocking your screen by chance? Thumbs up, yes, no, it looks okay. Nope, okay, good. Okay. You're all fine, good. I just wanna make sure I'm not blocking uh, your view with my arrow by trying to be able to see the chat while, <laughs> while doing this. So the first question we had for leadership was what has led veterinarians to leave your organization? And these are the results. And so I am going to ask you the same question. If you've had veterinarians leave your organization, or if you're a veterinarian, actually, no, don't answer it if you're a veterinarian yet. This is for non-vets. What has led veterinarians to leave your organization? And feel free to put it in the chat. Perhaps you've never had veterinarians leave your organization, and this is just how you're feeling about it. What you see here is from our survey, compensation was the number one reason that people in leadership felt that uh, veterinarians were leaving. The second highest reason was workload. You know, and that leads into compassion fatigue and burnout. We had a lot of people who were answering individually uh, that they were putting in their own answers, right? These were open answer questions. So we were grouping their answers to see. So workload, compassion fatigue, burnout, then this poor leadership and communication came up in multiple ways. There was also a, quite a bit of conversation in the open answer questions about lack of alignment with other departments or having poor culture fit for the individual. Type of medicine practiced is shelter medicine versus going into now emergency practice or private practice where it's the type of medicine that's being practiced, not necessarily the compensation associated with it, because there was there was more around that. Promotion to leadership or new opportunity, again, we were trying to tease that away from compensation in different ways based on what was being seen. Schedule, staffing, lack of resources, public pressure, hostile environment from the outside. And then conflict and values and culture showed up a little bit less location even less. And what I see here, just looking at it is uh, poor leadership, communication, maybe a new opportunity, compassion fatigue, burnout, compensation has shown up, taking away from their current business, no time off, conflict with leadership in the chat, uh, people leaving for full-time position in another organization that would get their loans paid, a discrepancy of priorities or values, Again, so a, a lot of a lot of different ideas. Some of them fit into what we're seeing here. 
And there was a separate study that was uh, run by Linda Darty and Dr. Neil through AWA that also asked leadership about veterinarians and why are veterinarians leaving their particular organization. And again, compensation or private practice salary comparison showed up as one of the, the highest values. Compassion fatigue, exposure to abuse, euthanasia also showed up. A lack of support of staff, budget constraints, undesirable geographic location, and long work hours after hours. So this is a question that was asked of non-veterinarians. So what we did is we asked veterinarians a similar question. Now we had to somewhat shift the question for the veterinarians who would be taking it. So we turned that around and said, what keeps you at your organization? And we asked the same question of leadership. What keeps veterinarians at your organization? And so I'm going to ask this of all of you again. So we, we just said, what has veterinarians leaving? What has them staying? You know, and see how that's a slightly different question. Here, what we saw as being very important was culture mission values. So team culture, where in the leadership questions, they didn't feel it was as important as what veterinarians were coming back and answering. They were saying, yes, this is really important to us, the culture of the team, and that we're willing to stay despite other things. Animal community impact is another one of those. Again, vision, mission, shared goals shows up. And so as you look across here, what are reasons and if you happen to be a veterinarian, I'd love to see your answers. What keeps you at your organization? Like, what is it that has you there? Is it location? Is it professional growth? Is it the type of medicine? Animal community impacts. Thanks, Sarah. And please, anyone else for leadership, what do you think keeps veterinarians there? These are some quotes that we have from, from our survey. And the color coordination again, uh, the, the colors are the same colors that you just saw before. So veterinarians not holding leadership roles are in the purple and the pinks or the vets in leadership roles. What you'll see is, you know, I love our team and how we all really want what's best for pets in the community. The support I have from my director is hands down the most important thing I must have to stay over money or anything else. I, I am needed and feel valued for what I contribute. Culture here is overall quite positive. And I see it's similar in the chat with the support of trying to get new things, a chance to grow, gain new skills. Vets are part of the culture and our passion about the care, a love of the team. And then again, for those not in leadership role, the people I work with, I enjoy being with them, working with them, the work environment, culture, great veterinary team members. So this idea of fostering the team culture is really important. And what was interesting is this particular question, there's actually two, but this question here with leadership support was interesting that there's a gap in the perception of leadership support with those vets not in leadership roles, not feeling like that's necessarily the thing that keeps them there. But those in leadership feeling like that's what keeps vets there, leadership support. And so that's an, an interesting perception. One view of leadership support shows up as autonomy and flexibility. So here in the non-vet leadership roles, there were comments about why and what keeps vets at the organization well, the flexibility and the autonomy that these individuals have given to the veterinarians in their teams and a varied work, right? A true say in decision-making and a clear understanding of their authority. And then this person wrote, give veterinarians autonomy for implementing effective shelter medicine practices, procedures, expenditures within organizational guardrails and budget constraints. And then from the veterinary standpoint, the feeling that they're trusted 
that the professional license and how they want to practice medicine is also valued and respected. And the ability to treat pets as individuals within the resources, balancing herd health and individualized medicine, right? Veterinary team making the decisions regarding veterinary patients. So really some, uh, this pull, which actually Lawrence mentions, the need to support animals in the team and the sense that someone will need to do it, right? There's there's some of that as well here that's showing up within the autonomy and flexibility question. We did uh, do this as a scientific paper. So uh, we have a lot of statistics. So when it comes out, you'll get to see some of that. I'm not presenting a lot of that today, but this is one component that I want to share with you. And it's an attitude toward veterinary leadership relationship effectiveness score that we came out with based on a series of Likert scale questions. And what you can see here and what this blocks plot is really trying to show is that veterinarians that are not in leadership positions had a statistically, dif statistically significant difference in their attitude towards their relationship with leadership than vets who are in leadership, right? And obviously people in leadership themselves. So there is a difference in how they view that relationship in itself. The next question we asked is, what are the key challenges that leadership and vets face when actually working together? So when you're working with leadership, what are the challenges? And again, I'm going to ask this back. And you can see how each of these questions is, hopefully you can see, is, is trying to pinpoint and see different angles of the same conversation around veterinarian leadership relationships and what keeps veterinarians at organizations, what has them in a successful working relationship, what has them lead. So for veterinarians, what uh, the most important things were lack of effective communication. That's a tremendous challenge when working with leadership. A difference in priorities and conflicting goals and a limited understanding or appreciation of veterinary expertise. So those showed up very strongly. For people in leadership, the questions and the choices were slightly different. Managing the wire wires that go from this button or from the switch down through the audio by chance through the handle and then out. Thank you. Over a period of time, just moving the wires fatigue on the inside. Yes. Okay. I think I'm back. I think I'm back. You can hear me. So. Um, some of the key challenges that leadership faced was managing the expectations and demands of veterinarians, managing veterinary team culture with other departments. Are they siloed? Are they maybe uh, operating as their own entity over here? That's what we were hearing, as opposed to being um, really engaged with the rest of the organization and balancing financial constraints with the need for quality veterinary care. So again, what are some of those key challenges that you've seen perhaps with the relationship with veterinarians, you know, the, the way that you've worked with medical teams? And please share again in the chat because it is helpful to hear what others are seeing. These are some differing factors on the perception of what makes a successful working relationship. And so feel free to answer it in either way. If you have a really successful working relationship, what is it that makes a really successful working relationship? And so these are some of the answers that were provided by veterinarians. For a vet in a leadership role, one person said they wish their CEO would meet with them to learn more about their medical program. They've actually never met with this individual. They're the head vet of the shelter. They're in a leadership position, but they don't get this opportunity to meet with the CEO. Another person said that teamwork and active involvement in the goals of the shelter. So what does it look like to, to acknowledge that the decisions that each of us makes does have an impact on one another? So involve veterinarians in a different way, in a way that perhaps this particular organization hasn't in choosing some of those goals. 
And then vets not in leadership roles have said that they've wanted to be invited into leadership meetings, that um, mutual respect and consulting the vet for medical and surgical decisions has been really important to them. Um, I'm noticing appreciation and gratitude with autonomy is showing up in the chat. Uh, leadership taking brief passive roles and learning from the vet team as well. And so the same question asked to those in leadership, in your opinion, what contributes to successful working relationship? Um, we have some interesting answers here. We have, oh, did not mean to go back. Hold on a second. We have direct dialogue, communicating clear agendas, objectives, honoring their expertise, openness, respecting the skills and abilities, communication, it's a big one. But then also there are these that say, letting the vet be a, let, a vet and leaving others to lead, not giving the veterinarians a leadership role. It is not what they are trained to do is what another person in leadership suggested. And now you can see how these answers, how, how this view perhaps butts up against the view that I just showed you, where veterinarians are saying, wait, we want to be included in some of these decisions. So perhaps it's not a horizontal structure. Perhaps it's having involvement through communication in a different way. And again, this is something to tease out for your own organization to determine where are people falling in this? You know, and again, I invite folks in the chat to place, what have you seen as being part of a successful working relationship? When we asked the question, the same question across the board, what do you see as the key factors contributing to a successful working relationship in your shelter? 68% of individuals answered communication. The next highest was deference with 34% and trust, decision-making, shared vision, mission goals. And there was a, a lot of other uh, questions that kind of, or answers that come around this, but across the board, it was communication. So I just wanna spend a couple minutes on communication specifically. We asked a few other questions because related to communication specifically, because we have always felt when we've talked in our consults and in other teams that everybody points back to communication, but what is that really? What, what does that mean? So we asked veterinarians, how often does leadership solicit feedback from veterinarians? And we asked the same question to leadership. And what you can see is it's across the board from never rarely to constantly always. And leadership feeling that they ask constantly always as opposed to never rarely. So there's a quantity of communication. We also asked how frequently do you receive updates and information from leadership regarding organizational changes decisions and important matters affecting your work as a veterinarian. You can see that the same question when asked has somewhat of a similar graph, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and then people saying rarely, never, only after a decision's been made, or as much as needed, we do check-ins weekly and so on. So this again speaks to the frequency of, relation, of the relationship, right? The frequency of communication but it doesn't speak to the quality of it. And that's what we were trying to get at with this question. How would you rate the clarity of leadership's communications to you regarding organizational goals, policies, expectations? And here what we saw is all across the board from unclear and confusing to crystal clear and well-defined. And so what this and other questions that I'm not showing here due to lack of time have shown us is that the quality of communication that leads to really this co-creation of a successful working relationship is distinct from frequency of communication. Right? So you can, you can get bombarded with lots of emails saying lots of stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's this working relationship that's happening in that communication. 
And so how can we reframe our approach to communication? And this is something that we have been thinking a lot about as a team. A part of it is thinking about different communication styles. So if as a leadership team, we have town hall forums or open question forums where we have staff come and we ask them questions and we want them to come back with ideas where we might present a goal or a particular scenario and say, how do you feel about this? There may be some people on our team that need time to process that, to take it back with them, to sort of think it through and then come back. And so if a person's communication style is to first really think it through, process it, have time to formulate their ideas and then come back, that open forum type setting might not be a great place to receive feedback from them. If, however, you have people who are really fast to speak up about certain ideas or certain concepts, they um, might dominate that conversation or they might need more time to think about how they even responded. So think about how this shows up in your organizations. And actually, I'm curious, does this even resonate with folks out there? Like this idea of having different communication styles and what does that look like? So please feel free to put that in the chat. I'd like to just point out that much of the communication that happens in organizations such as ours is very transactional. We are going from action item to action item to action item. And so much of the communication is requests. It's a, asking somebody to do something. And this is where we can create clarity around what we're needing we might not even know what success looks like for the other person to complete an action. We might say, we need this done without having actually thought through, well, what does it look like to actually have that complete? The other place that often, especially in sheltering communications where you're speaking to somebody else in an organization, you're passing them, you see them all the time, there can be an assumption that the other person knows when you want something to be done. You might say, well, I need these medications filled and then leave that setting. And in your mind, you need it filled by the end of the day, but the other person might think that it could get filled the next day. So setting that clear deadline can actually help with some of this. Having opportunities for the person who's receiving this to be able to clarify expectations is also really important because Again, a person might receive this request, think about it, and then have a whole bunch of questions and to be able to understand, well, how do I actually get this done? I don't have the resources, for example, to be able to get what it is you're asking of me. And then recognizing that there's a really distinct role between the person asking and the person being asked, and that's the speaker and listener. And so it um, it's definitely, uh, these are, critical roles that we take on and we're constantly shifting between them. So recognizing when we're in one of them can be really important and noticing what assumptions we're carrying, right? Because we have a lot of assumptions often that we're carrying into whatever it is that we're doing. It might be as simple as knowing how we, and again, I'm thinking about it from the veterinary standpoint, perhaps we might have an assumption that our technicians understand what we're saying when we're asking for a particular drug to be dosed out. And that could be an assumption that maybe there's four different vets and they all do it differently. And so we might have an assumption that everybody understands how we do it, but others might not have that same feeling. And so when in doubt, ask ask questions. And this was a slide that we had from a day-long session that Dr. Kate Hurley, Dr. Nellie Getz, Dr. Christy Camilla, and Hurt, whose last name I'm not going to be able to pronounce correctly, but he is the CEO of Humane Society Silicon Valley, uh, that we all gave at uh, Expo recently. And Really, the question is, are we asking each other these types of questions? Like, how can communication be better supported? You know, what's really frustrating about your job? You know, what would you love to be doing two years from now? What's one thing that would help the most? And actually, it, again, in the chat, oh, thank you. Uh, Kurt Krakenberg, 
Krickenberg, perhaps. And Krista, please let me know if I'm pronouncing that wrong because I haven't had the opportunity to pronounce his name, but I do appreciate you putting it there. And I apologize for Kirk. Close. Okay, close, but not close. You know, having a name of Jyothi, I am really familiar with the way that my name gets shifted. So I, I apologize again for that. So uh, again, in the chat, if there's other questions that you wish you were being asked or that you think need to be asked, feel free to share it here. Like what else would you want people to be asking you or asking of your job? And from the flip side of this, there's a listening component to this, right? So we ask the question, but if we don't listen to the answer, then that's even more frustrating. A part of it is in that conversation. So this is my dog, Pepper. By the way, a lot of those images were my pets. And this is this is Pepper. And she always tilts up her ear and listens in a really cute, cute way. So I always use her for this slide. So what what is it that we're asking of others. Our, in summary, our study showed communication and organizational cohesion as being really important, that dialogue. The leadership approach, meaning are we actively seeking contribution from all organizational members? It doesn't mean that everybody has to be on the leadership team. It means does everybody's feeling like they're being heard and that their contribution is really important? And that looking at these role-based perspectives, right, we definitely saw a distinct difference, statistical difference, between those vets in leadership roles and those vets not. And so consider those role-based perspectives when developing organizational strategies and communication policies. I'd like to share now the resources, the last resources that I have. So this bottom QR code that's purple with this link. Can some, let me see if I can get it. I don't actually, I don't know how to drop it into the slide. Oh, maybe it's there. Yay, Ross, uh, whose name is showing up as Clinton Mock, but that's Ross. And he just dropped the survey. And this is the vet leadership survey that I'd love to see how you all feel about it. And please put in what your role is recognize that this was created originally for CEOs, executive directors of shelters and veterinarians. But now the same survey we're looking to broaden out. So view the questions as you're able to view them. So that's what this is. This top link is to a Maddie's University module where the last two sections of the module are on communication or the last section is. So that might be of interest to all of you and it's free. And I think you can, veterinarians can get race credits and other credits for that. Out of that module, we had five deep dive sessions. Each of those deep dive sessions is going to become a deep dive mini module by September. Actually, two of those are almost done. So this will have a whole section on communication and then a separate section on productivity that you might find to be really interesting. So that's coming out. And I have to say deep, deep thanks to Maddie that we are going to be having a leadership program through Maddie's Fund and the Journey You Own that'll be coming out soon. I wanted to just mention it here. You'll be hearing definitely a lot more about that as the months continue. So that... Hopefully you've all had a moment to just look at that. Those are the resources. I'd love to say thank you. And let me take myself out of share so I can, I can actually look at people. <laughs> and maybe take me out of this pinned view or, or maybe everybody else, I can already shift it myself into gallery view. There you go. I'm in gallery view now. So I would love to, you know, we're almost at time, but I'd love to hear from anybody who's interested in, in speaking or has more questions. Uh, Michelle, love to hear your thoughts since you did a doctoral program for this. I know that there's also one other person from Arizona Animal Welfare League that did a master's 
uh, similarly on veterinarians and leadership. So please, anyone who wants to come off chat. Hi there, this is Michelle. Michelle, thank you for pronouncing that for me. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, so I did a full doctorate study on leadership uh, and communication as it related to veterinarians. And this, at this point, was focused on veterinarians in private practice. And it aligned with everything that you talked about today. It did not change. Um, it didn't change anything that you had said or, or in the last seven years, it hasn't changed much. Uh, eight, nine years, because it was 2015. So it was really com came down to communication, style of communication, style of leadership, inclusiveness, um, respect, um, thoroughness in communication and delivery of the communication in the tone and in clarity. Um, so those were the kind of key aspects um, that came out of the study that I did. Um, and it was mostly answered by um, coworkers and um, line staff in trying to figure out the pieces of who is uh, the important people in wanting to respect veterinarians in their communication style and keeping employees long-term. That is fantastic, Michelle. I am assuming that I have likely quoted your work somewhere in this paper. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Thank so, you. <laughs> and if if you have an email address that you can share, I or at least with me, I, I think you can privately share if you don't want to share it with everybody. I would love to learn more from what you've learned. I, I, I mean, you've done an entire doctoral dissertation. So a lot more mm -hmm. a, a, of an expert on this than I am. So it would be fantastic to learn from you and learn from what you've found during your dissertation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Will do. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and others, let's see, we're almost at time. I think we end, do we end at 10 too? Yes. Yeah, yep. We are just coming up on new uh, time right now. Um, so this was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. And I think it sets up uh, the course that will be coming soon. I was glad to see that. And if many of you have not been to Maddie's University, it is a great resource. And I would encourage you to go there. Uh, I'm definitely uh, looking out for uh the uh the upcoming leadership program but there are tons of other uh existing uh programs on communication on leadership on management that are there as well so i highly encourage you to uh to go there um if you have any additional questions um please feel free to go to uh the link that we have right here uh for our maddie's pet form for this call and Jyoti will be uh, able to see your questions and respond to any that she wasn't able to get to today. Um, but if I'm like Sean Ye, uh and much of our audience would like to uh, share you share with you, Jyoti, huge uh, appreciation for everything that you shared today because it is timely, it is very poignant, and I think it is going to be very much insightful. And we're going to need to have another one of these very very soon. Yes. Well, I, I look forward to seeing people in the community conversations. And then for anyone that wants to email me, let's see if I can drop that into the chat. If you have questions or anything else, there's my email. So send, send me a message and then please take that survey and take a look. And I'd, I'd love to see your responses as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody.